Hi, hello, then Samale. All right, so greetings and welcome everyone tonight. So first of all, we begin with the questions. We have three questions from uh, the English and five questions from the Chinese. So eight questions altogether. The first one from the English audience uh, is asking this. So in terms of learning Dharma and practice, uh, suppose we have one individual that is learning Dharma only by reading texts and by listening to YouTube recordings, um, as opposed to a person who directly attends the teachings in the presence of a teacher. So is there a difference there? Um, and also, we have a second uh, part in this question. Again, is there a difference uh, when you attend, as we do here, like a Zoom class in real time, as opposed to coming later and watching the video in YouTube and so forth. So the question is, is there a difference in terms of quality and so forth? Okay, so usually saying, um, of course, imagine you're here and you, you are alone at home and you do your own study. So you look at different texts and you are looking at the internet and you can find uh, various things posted in the internet. And actually you can get quite a lot of teachings from various teachers in the internet. So by relying on the books and by relying on YouTube, definitely you can get the information. You can get the knowledge. There is no question about it. So let's compare this situation to the situation where you actually go and meet the teacher and you are in the presence of the teacher as the teacher is uh, transmitting or is giving you the teaching. In this second case, you get all the information, right? But in addition to that, you get the blessing. You get the lineage of the blessing, Right, so the blessing of the lineage, which is quite important. In both cases, the amount of information that you get is the same because in a recording, in a video recording and so forth, all the words of the teacher are recorded. So you're not missing any information. In both cases, the information is the same. But the big difference is that when you are in the presence of the teacher, you receive the blessing of the lineage, which is unique and you only get in his presence. And Geshe was saying, I remember in the monastery, you know, back then when we had tape recorders, okay, so you would go to class, Petri, it's called Petri, so the, the teacher is reading through the text and giving you explanation. And we also got the permission at some point to record those teachings but it was understood that the recordings are there to help you just in case you forget something you didn't keep a proper notes so you could go at a later time you would go back and listen again just in case you forgot something but that was never given a substitute of actually physically attending because when you physically attend and make the effort to listen you are in the presence of the teacher not only you do you receive the loom the transmission you receive the commentary you receive all the information but also you receive the blessing okay which you cannot just get simply from listening the recording so i hope that clarifies that issue and actually it's the same principle when we compare the live zoom to the video uh, youtube the live zoom you're in the presence of the teacher as the teacher is communicating this so you receive the blessing in the recording that you listen the next day, you get the same information, but you don't get the blessing. All right, so that's it. So, okay, so we said that if you are in the presence of the teacher, you receive the blessing. And the blessing that you receive is the blessing that comes from the oral tradition or oral transmission. So when we use this word oral here, it means it is communicated directly from the mouth to the ear. Right, So there is that oral lineage, that oral tradition that we want to maintain. And this is the specific blessing that you get. So Geshe is saying, I do not think that you get it with a recording, whether it is just like a cassette or audio recording or a video recording. 
You don't get it in recording. You get it in real time. Okay, now interestingly, since these days we're using the internet quite a lot and there are teachings, there are transmissions, even initiations um, over the internet. There are some people who say you do not actually receive the initiation. You do not actually trans receive the transmission. However, Geshe says they, these people, they have not come with a clear reason to prove that, to establish that. And Gishla says, I do not agree with this position. If you are attending in real time, I think you get it. And uh, we have precedent of that at the time of the Buddha. So there was a situation where uh, someone wanted to receive ordination. Now for ordination to be received, you need to have a certain number of fully ordained monks that gather in this location in order for the ordination to take place. However, sometimes due to the difficulties, and back then, you know, it was difficult to arrive at the, at the right place at the right time for all to gather together for the ceremony to take place. And the Buddha himself had given ordination vows through a letter. So if that was possible at the time of the Buddha, these days that we have evolved our means of communication, definitely we can use the internet, but real time not recording real time as it happens. So, okay, the second question is about the visualization that we do. And we say when we take the main figure of the merit field to be Guru Shakyamuni, Buddha Shakyamuni, then uh, Buddha Shakyamuni dissolves into the Guru at the crown of our head. The Guru at the crown of our head becomes Guru Shakyamuni. And then when he dissolves into us, we become... Buddha Shakyamuni, and then from our heart, we send out rays of light. They strike sentient beings, and those sentient beings, they become enlightened in the aspect of Buddha Shakyamuni. So this is the standard visualization we have been describing. And the question is here, what about if the main figure of the merit field is Lama Tsongkhapa? Do we have to change the visualization in this case? And Geshe is saying, yes, you will do exactly that. If the main figure of the merit field is Lama Tsongkhapa, then Lama, you know, the whole merit field will dissolve into Lama Tsongkhapa. Then Lama Tsongkhapa will come and dissolve in the guru at the crown of your head. So now the guru at the crown of your head becomes Lama Tsongkhapa, enlightened as Lama Tsongkhapa. And that enlightened being in the, as Lama Tsongkhapa comes and dissolves into you, you become enlightened as Lama Tsongkhapa. And when you send out rays of light from your heart and strike all sentient beings, you bring all those sentient beings to enlightenment as Lama Tsongkhapa's, enlightened Lama Tsongkhapa's. Uh, so whoever is the main figure, whatever is the aspect of the main figure, you will become this and you will enlighten sentient beings in that aspect. And we can see this in the general sadhana practice and so forth. So for example, if you're practicing Yamantaka yourself, you arise in the enlightened form of Yamantaka and you send out rays of light from your heart and you lead all sentient beings to Buddhahood in the aspect of Yamantaka. If you practice in Guya Samaja, you become Guya Samaja, everybody else becomes Guya Samaja. So we transform the visualization. Okay, the second question um, is um, a question about this practice that we do. So we say, when uh, I, am, uh, I become Buddha Shakyamuni, I send rays of light from my heart and I purify samsaric world and, uh, into pure lands and I purify all sentient beings into Buddhas. At that point, we are benefiting sentient beings. But the question is, uh, from the conventional and from the ultimate point of view, what is the benefit to sentient beings? And con continuing from that, how do we have the final or the maximum benefit to sentient beings? So Geshe was saying, I think that if we're talking about conventional and ultimate benefit to sentient beings, you can look at it from the point of view of developing different types of visual of uh, realizations. 
So we know that we have two lineages. We have the lineage of extensive contact. So from the conventional point of view, you can say that those sentient beings are benefited because they generate in their mind stream their realization of the extensive deeds. And whatever they realize, they increase this realization so that it does not decline. And that will be a conventional benefit to sentient beings. So this is a benefit that comes from developing the realizations of the lineage of extensive deeds. Then we have the uh, lineage of the profound view. So here we're talking about emptiness. So when you think that through this process, sentient beings generate in their continuing realization of emptiness that they didn't have before, and that further they're able to increase that realization without any decline, any deterioration, in that sense, you can say that you are establishing the ultimate benefit for sentient beings, which is the benefit of developing the realizations of the lineage of the profound view. Then, in terms of uh, benefit of sentient beings, again, you can talk about temporary benefit and you can talk about the ultimate benefit. When you talk about the immediate or the temporary benefit, uh, you can identify three types of this. The first one is to cause sentient beings to enter into the path. So those who have not entered, they can enter. The second one is to mature sentient beings. Those who have not been mature, they become mature. And the third one is those who have not been liberated, you liberate them. So this is temporary benefit. As for the ultimate benefit, this is to reach the point of Buddhahood. This is the maximum. There is no other benefit higher than this. Yes. Okay, so now we begin with the Chinese uh, questions, uh, questions from the Chinese speaking audience. The first one has actually three parts. The first part is saying, I have heard that when we eat any food, we must leave a small amount, which we make as an offering to our protector. Is that right? And if that is right, how do we actually do it? The second question is, I don't seem to be able to remember the names of all the lamas, direct and indirect lamas in the married field, um, and their characteristics. Is this a problem, and how can I work through this difficulty? And the third one has to do with activities, and is asking, uh, do we have to pray to the three jewels for every type of activity that we do, or is it enough just to pray for big activities or serious activities, and not so important to pray uh, for smaller activities? So, okay, so the first one about dedicating part and offering part of the food that you eat. Okay, so definitely there is this practice of leaving a small amount in after you have eaten, leave a small amount of food and dedicate this and offer it. However, you don't offer it to your protector or to your guardian deity. There is, you must have misunderstood this part. But I will explain to who you offer it. At the time of the historical Buddha, Buddha Shakyamuni, there was a hungry ghost. She was a mother and she had 500 hungry ghost little children. So she was looking everywhere. Her main responsibility was to provide food and nourishment for those children. And it was very difficult to maintain those, all those 500 children. And she ended up actually attacking um, humans. So she was actually targeting human children, right? So she was attacking and killing and taking their life. And in this way, she was sustaining herself because she had great difficulty sustaining uh, all her, you know, 500 children and her children were reducing in number and she was left with this one very precious child. So at this point, um, Buddha Shakyamuni appeared and he said, look, there is no reason for you. Please, you know, stop. Why are you attacking children? And she explained her difficulty. And he said, please, if I can, I will offer something to you if you promise never to attack humans again. 
So he says, I will give food to you, but you have to make this promise. And she says, okay, I will make the promise, but what about when you pass into Paranirvana? Who's going to provide the food? And Buddha Shakyamuni says, don't you worry about this. I will tell all my followers and disciples that they have to make this type of offering to you. And if they don't make this offering, then I will not consider them my disciples. So she thought that that was a fair enough deal. So she agreed to this. So what we make is um, pressing like uh, the impression of our fingers and thumb. So imagine if you have a piece of bread that you knead it in your, in, you put it inside your fist, right? And you leave the impression of your four fingers and your thumb in it. Okay, so the way that we make this offering is we have one torma for the guru and around that tome of the guru we have three of those finger impressions okay they're called jambu so one is for the jumbo spirits one is for that female hungry ghost mother and the third one is for her 500 children okay so it's a misunderstanding it's not to the protector or the guardian, it is to a hungry ghost lady. Okay, the second question uh, is like, I cannot remember the names of all the lineage gurus and their attributes, direct and lineage gurus. We have, um, we have an answer to that. There is actually a very thick volume that Geshe-la demonstrated. It contains the biography of all the lineage lamas of the Lamrim. And if you open up in the first page where you have the contents, in the contents page, you have the name of each lama of each one of the lineage, the extensive deed, the profound view, and so on and so forth. So you basically you have a list of names there and you can keep looking at it so you can memorize at least their names. And if you have time, you can actually start reading the biography. And the more information you attach to this name, hopefully will help you remember their names better. Okay. Uh, now, for the third question, third question was about praying in terms of activities that we do. So is it, do we have to pray for every activity that we do, like minor activities as well, or just the serious ones? Actually, it is part of our commitments when we take refuge that we do pray to the three jewels for any activity big and small and good and insignificant, extensive, long-term activity, uh, every activity that we do. So it is very good to follow this and make prayers um, for any type of activity we do. Don't consider even the smallest activity to be too insignificant to pray about it. And if you do like this, then definitely you're keeping the commitments that came with your refuge. So it's a good practice to maintain. Okay, the second question is a question uh, that uh, we have when we are in the point of uh, training in uh, Guru devotion. There are two. We, are, we train to rely through thought and to rely through action. And uh, at this point, uh, the text or the visualization that we do is that nectar descends from the body of the guru uh, to myself and all sentient beings. Um, our bodies are purified, negativity is purified, uh, our bodies are purified, and we generate a special realization. So the question is, what is the special realization in this context? Is it the, the capacity to make offerings to the guru, to offer service to the guru, and to practice according to his advice? Is this what is it is referring to? And Gesha is saying, yes, it is exactly this. In this context, you are training to, to be able to develop correct devotion in terms of action. And the way that we do this is by making material offerings to the guru, uh, serving the guru with respect in various occasions, and uh, also ac acting exactly according to the guru's instructions. 
And from those three, we have said that the third one, which is to put his words into practice, is the supreme offering. So the realization here is to be able to do all those things. And in particular, in the third case, if the guru says you do this, then you do it. If the guru says don't do this, you don't do it. It's like this. Okay, the third question is this. When we're in the section of... Um, remembering the teacher's kindness. We remember that the teacher is kind in three, three ways. He teaches us Dharma, he blesses our mind stream, and he keeps us, he, he invites us closer by various presents. So the question was about this, you know, he blesses our mind stream. So does that mean that we can actually uh, just practice guru devotion and then keep receiving these blessings and these blessings will have an accumulative effect so without putting a lot of effort from our side without practicing without studying if we just receive those blessings from the teacher can we become enlightened in this way so Geshe I was saying Actually, no, we have to be very clear. You cannot become enlightened merely by receiving a blessing and without putting any effort of study and practice from your own side, right? So when we say that he blesses our mind stream, what we mean is that we see a definite improvement. So we, from our side, we have to engage into listening, meaning attending teachings. We have to engage in contemplation and we have to engage in meditation. So from our side, we have to make this effort. But the blessings will make the difference because they, like the study will become more extensive. The understanding will become deeper. The concentration during the meditation will become uh, uh, more stable and so forth, right? So there will be an improvement of whatever, an enhancement of whatever effort we put. So, for example, you might study something but don't understand the meaning or you partially understand the meaning but you cannot retain it, you cannot remember it. So by receiving a blessing, you will develop the understanding. You will retain the meaning of what you have understood. Or, you know, then in terms of your contemplation, you might not be able to think broadly and vastly about those things. But with the blessing, something changes in your mind and now you can think deeper, you can reflect more on this. Then... Perhaps you have a problem in terms of your practice. You're practicing, you're meditating, but you're not generating any realizations. So the difference that the blessing will do is that if you put the effort from your side to do the practice, you will see the realizations coming. So that's the difference. So if we are to meditate in four sessions a day, how do we actually do it? So let's say we're meditating here on Guru devotion. Uh, is it that we take the different subjects of Guru devotion and we divide them and allocate one subject per session? So, for example, have one, the first session, remembering the kindness of the Guru, the second uh, training in faith, the third one, remembering the benefits of relying on the teacher, and the fourth one, remembering the disadvantages of not relying on the Guru. Is this, would, is this the way to do it, like allocating one subject per session, or do we have to meditate on the entire material on each individual session? Okay, so Geshe is saying that basically here you have to follow uh, what is more suitable for yourself. So whatever is suiting your needs and your mind better, that will be the most appropriate advice. If we look at the shorter lumberings like the easy path and the quick path, definitely they indicate that you perform the entire meditation on Guru devotion in one session. 
However, what is understood here is that before you start doing this meditation, you have already meditated as a preliminary on the benefits of relying on the teacher and the disadvantages of not relying on the teacher. So then in one single session, you will cover the subjects of training in faith, that is the root, and the second one, remembering his kindness in order to generate respect. Uh, actually, having said that, this is uh, this is obviously the case in the short lamrims, but most lamrims indicate this, that you just perform the whole meditation in one session. Um, however, if you find that difficult to have all this information in one session, definitely you can break it down in different sessions. If you break it down in four sessions, the correct order is that the first session has to be meditation on the benefits of relying on the teacher. The second session is the disadvantages of not relying on the teacher. The third one is training in faith, that is the root. And the fourth one is remembering his kindness in order to generate respect. So this is the correct order if you break down one subject per session. Okay, now there is the other tradition, the other advice that says that it is actually to perform meditation on the entire subject of the Lam Rim in every session because in this way you place imprints of the entire path in your mind. So that means that in one session you will have to cover all the subjects from the first one, which is the proper way to rely on the teacher, all the, all the way up to how to cultivate union of calm abiding and special insight. Okay, if that is too much, again, you can break it down in four sessions. So let's say in the first session, you do this, the two subjects. You do how to properly rely on the teacher and you do all the meditations of the individual of the small scope. In the second session, you will do all the material of the individual of the middle scope. In the third session, you will do the sevenfold cause and result method for generating bodhicitta and the method equalizing and exchanging self and others. And in the fourth se session, you will do the six perfections and then especially the, the last parts of union of calm abiding and special insight. Or again, if, um, let, let's say, you know, guru devotion is the subject that you really want to meditate upon, this becomes the one and only meditation session. And you will meditate on this until you induce the realization. You will not move into another session, another subject, until you have the realization. So that means that is your main subject for all four sessions. However, on the side, you will perform a very quick bullet point meditation of the stages of the path so that you have the entire range of the path on every session. And the last question is the question about the way that we view the guru. So do we have to see the guru as being the Buddha or as being similar to a Buddha? So which of the two is it? So definitely when we say we view the guru as the Buddha, that means that the guru is Buddha. It is only the case that the guru will appear to us in an ordinary aspect because he has to appear in an aspect that is fitting to our merit, right, or to our fortune. However, the guru and the Buddha are one continuum. They are not separate. They have exactly the same nature, and the nature is indivisible, as we say in Tantra. So the Guru is the Buddha. Okay, so Geshe is saying I mentioned uh, uh, a term here that if, let's say, you take uh, Guru devotion as being your main subject, uh, on the side of that, you have to do a quick uh, bullet, boy, 
bullet point meditation on the remaining parts of the lam rim. So to give you an example of that, how we do this, usually is we do it by reciting a short lam rim text, such as the foundation of all good qualities. The foundation of all good qualities contains all the stages of the path from correctly relying to the guru up to obtaining the union of a non-learner. So as you quickly recite that text, you have this awareness where you say, oh, there is this point, this point, this point, this point. So you identify, quickly identify all the points of the Lam Rim. So this is what is like the bullet point meditation. Then we have another type of analytical meditation that we can perform. And this is different. In this case, you open up the text and you read the passage and the passage will be longer, obviously, right? And uh, you analyze each one and you identify each section and you say, oh, this is this section, this section, this section. Okay, so this completes the answers to the questions and we will now proceed with new material. Okay, so we're at the point where we're looking at the, the proper way to rely on the teacher and the way that this is presented is what you do during the session and what you do during uh, between sessions. So what you do during the session is divided into three parts. We have the preliminaries, the actual part and the conclusion. Now, we mentioned that in the beginning, we, it is very good to engage the six types of preliminaries. There is also the tradition of doing what is known the Ngondro, so the Again, they are preliminaries, um, there are five preliminaries, and you can do those before you begin your actual retreat or your actual practice. Okay, so... Um, each one of those preliminary practices will be repeated a hundred thousand times. The first one of those five preliminaries is going for refuge. And uh, the going for refuge is very important for us because, as we say, it's the gateway to Buddhism. The second thing that we have to do in order to progress along the path is to purify our negativities. And there are actually two ways of doing this. One way is to offer prostrations and the other one is to recite the hundred syllable mantra of Vajrasattva. So a hundred thousand of each, a hundred thousand prostration, a hundred thousand recitations of Vajrasattva. The next important thing for us after purification is to build up our accumulation. And we do this by making mandala offerings. So a hundred thousand times of mandala offerings. And finally, what we want to do is we want to receive blessings by making requests. And we do this by making the request through the mitzema, a hundred thousand times of mitzema prayers. These are the five preliminaries. Okay, now when uh, we engage in various practices, the important thing is to follow this advice. The advice, the very special advice, is that we take Guru Yoga as being the core of our practice. It is like the lifeblood of our practice. And the way that we do this is whatever subject we are meditating upon, whatever realization, whatever practice we do, we visualize at the crown of our head our guru, and we see this guru as being the embodiment of all objects of refuge. And with that recognition, we make very strong petitions to receive the blessings of to be able to um, have the realization of whatever subject we meditate upon. So this is not something to be omitted. It is a very special instruction, a very special advice. It is said again and again that this is like the life of the path. It's like the blood, the lifeblood of the path. It's not a step we would omit. So, Okay, so we'll continue now. We're on page eight. The second paragraph, we're on the second outline, how to practice during the intervals between sessions. So you have done your sessions, you have broken the session now, you've finished with the session and you are in in-between period. So it says, it consists of reading scriptures and commentaries explaining the way to practice guru devotion towards the spiritual teachers. 
practicing how to restrain the doors of the senses with mindfulness and introspection, adopting an appropriate diet, stri striving to practice without sleeping at the inappropriate time and acting correctly at the time of sleeping, as well as striving in the yoga of washing and eating. So the first advice that we have is that once you break your session, you, um, you can read different material, but don't read just any novel that happens to come into your hands, right? It's a very specific material. The advice that we have here is that we read material that they talk about the proper way to practice guru devotion. So we can have teachings like this from our teacher, Guru Chakemuni, from the first turning of the will of Dharma, the second turning of the will of Dharma, where the Prajnaparamita texts were given, the third turning of the will of Dharma. There are specific instances and in stories and materials there that are very useful. Also, we can look at various stories and biographies. For example, how Naropa relied on Tilopa, how Marpa relied on Naropa, how Milarepa relied on Marpa Lutsawa, how Dromtumpa relied on his teacher like Master Atisha and so forth. So these are very, these are great examples. We can learn quite a lot from reading those stories. So as you can see here, the advice is that during the break, we read material that is relevant to guru devotion. So you meditate on one thing and then in the break you can read other additional material. So as we say, material that we can find relevant in the three turnings of the will of Dharma and also the biographies of those great uh, personalities, you know, Naropa and Marpa and Milarepa and Dromtompa, how did each one of those beings rely on their teachers? So the first advice that we were given about what we can do in between breaks is to read scriptures and commentaries explaining the way to practice guru devotion towards the spiritual teacher. The second thing that it mentioned in the list here is practicing how to restrain the doors of the senses with mindfulness and introspection. So we are in between session here and it says here that we have to restrain the doors of the senses. We rely upon two things, mindfulness and introspection. So restrain the doors of the senses here, it means that we will not engage uh, for example, we will not see or we will not hear unnecessary, unnecessarily engage beautiful or disturbing objects. All right. So you use your mindfulness and your introspection and says, I will not look. I will not listen. Okay. This is how you restrain the senses. The other meaning that it has that even if you happen to see them, because these objects just appear to your senses, right, involuntarily. So um, if you see something beautiful, you know that you will generate attachment. So you see something beautiful appears. It's not that you're intentionally looking. It just it appeared to you. So now, again, relying on mindfulness and introspection, you say, I will not engage that mind of attachment. Or if something disturbing appears, again, by using mindfulness and introspection, you say, I will not let my mind become disturbed by this. I will not generate hatred. So this is why we how we restrain the doors of the senses. Okay, so we mentioned here how important it is in, in between sessions to rely upon mindfulness and introspection. You put a lot of effort during the actual session when you're meditating. And obviously you do this because you want to have some progress. Uh, however, if you let yourself completely loose in the in-between period, in-between sessions, you are undoing whatever pro progress you try to establish during the actual session. So you cannot just let yourself loose and do whatever comes to mind in between sessions, right? As soon as you finish your meditation. We say that we have to rely, rely upon mindfulness. That means that if, for example, you're meditating on guru devotion, if you are in between sessions, you remind yourself about 
guru devotion, guru devotion, the importance of guru devotion again and again. And also you're applying introspection. Introspection means you're checking your mind. It's like, okay, I'm not meditating right now. I'm having a break. What is my mind doing? So keep checking your mind and reminding yourself about the subject that you are meditating upon. Okay. The next thing in our list is adopting an appropriate diet. If you are a serious practitioner, if you are a serious meditator, diet and the, the quality of food uh, and the amount of food that you eat is very important because you know that if you exceed a certain limit in terms of amount, if you overeat, this brings about a slugginess, a heaviness, not just in the body, but also in the mind. So if you're serious about med meditating, definitely you want to regulate the amount. You must know what's the proper amount. So in terms of the proper amount, imagine that you divide your stomach into three parts. One part you will fill with solids, one part you will fill with liquids, and the third part has to remain empty. So Gesha says, of course, you know, we all car get carried away when the food is delicious, we fill it to the rim. But the rule is at least one third has to be empty. Um, okay, one thing here, since we're talking about food, and it's not just to understand the measure or how much food you, you should eat, but the other thing is that you should eat appropriate food which does not produce afflictions, or it's not appro uh, associated with afflictions. And... Um, this, uh, this is advice that comes from Master Asanga. He makes, their, he makes a comment about that. Do not eat food that is inappropriate because it produces afflictions. And definitely there is a reference to that in the motivation. So, for example, when you go out uh, begging with your begging bowl, right, uh, for food, it says your motivation should not be attachment for food. So make sure it is not mixed with afflictions. Okay, then uh, the next one is striving to practice without sleeping at the inappropriate time. So the other thing that we have to take into consideration is sleep, the duration of our sleep. Now, the general advice is that in order to maintain uh, the well-being of our body, we require eight hours of sleep. This, we have to understand, that is a general uh, let's say recommendation, but different people have different needs in terms of sleep. Some people need less sleep, some people need more sleep depending on their constitution. So you can find people who can sleep for six hours or even five hours and this is enough for them. Uh, Gesselas is, I fall in this category, it is, I'm a six hour sleeper. If I stay any longer, if I sleep any longer, actually it doesn't benefit me, but it will give me a headache. It seems that my sleeping time is naturally exhausted within six hours. There are other people who need more than eight hours of sleep because of their constitution. So you have to find according to your constitution, what is the appropriate amount of sleep and sleep that amount. You know, this again, you know, we should not be over sleeping uh, out of attachment for sleep. Also, uh, when we go for sleep, there is, there is a proper way to go for sleep and we should observe those things. Okay, so um, the next thing is what do we actually do? How do we properly go for sleep? So just before we go for sleep, it is very important to examine our, the activities that we have performed during this day. And if we find that it has been a fruitful day, we establish quite a lot of virtue, then it is very good to rejoice in that, that we did, and then say, you know, tomorrow as well, I will do as I did today. If you examine your activities and you find that actually you didn't practice enough virtue, you wasted the time, you wasted the day, you should uh, generate regret because you have wasted the whole day, isn't it? And have the very strong determination that tomorrow I'm not going to waste my day like this. I will create as much virtue as possible. 
Now, if it is more serious than this, if you, during this examination you find that you have actually committed a lot of negative actions, it is very important before you go to sleep that you confess and you purify that negativity. And having done that, you're ready now to lie down in your bed and sleep. It is very good to assume the, uh, the particular posture uh, that is called the lion's posture. As Master Shandideva says, when you go to sleep, assume the posture, si posture similar to that uh, that our teacher assumed when he passed into Paranirvana. So just uh, remember uh, how our teacher demonstrated passing away. It was the last of the 12 deeds. And he adopted, he lay down and adopted this particular posture of the lion. So you put the right hand, so basically you lie on your right side with the left thigh on top of the right thigh. The right hand is under your head and the left arm is extended and resting upon your left thigh. So this is the posture, the lying posture that is known as yeah, the lion posture of the Buddha. So it is very good to assume this lying posture. As we say, it is known as the, the lion lying posture. And uh, remember the last activity of our teacher, Buddha Shakyamuni. So it's as each one of the aspects of this uh, posture establishes auspicious interdependence. For example, the head is... Um, pointing towards the east, your mouth is facing towards the west, uh, you have support from the back and so forth. Each one has an individual meaning. Okay, so after we have gone into sleep in that posture, the next one, if you look in the text, it says, as well as striving in the yoga of washing and eating. So this one, uh, actually a yoga is that you do after you rise from your sleep. So you go to sleep, you wake up, and you do things such as washing yourself and then eating. So in this way, we have gone through the activities that we do in the intervals between sessions, and this consists of reading scriptures and commentaries, explaining the way to practice good devotion towards the spiritual teacher, practicing how to restrain the doors of the senses with mindfulness and introspection, adopting an appropriate diet, striving to practice without sleeping at the inappropriate time, and acting correctly at the time of sleeping, as well as striving in the yoga of washing and eating. Okay, so Gisha would like to conclude the presentation of the text here. So as you can see, we have covered this first part, which is how to train in properly relying on the teacher that is the root of the path. This is presented in two sessions, what you do during the actual meditation session and what you do in between sessions. Um, following the presentation here of the easy path, as we have said this many times, it is a short text. So again, this presentation has been a concise presentation. You can get a much more extensive presentation. For example, if you look at Lamrim Chenmo, Lama Kappa has a very detailed and very good explanation of all the issues involved in this. And in particular, he explains very well with uh, scriptural references and logic and quotations, the importance of what you do during the main session and then what you do in the in-between sessions. Very good to look at Lamrim Chenmo. Okay, so if you have any questions now, we have time for questions. All right, so um, I think we have time hopefully for two questions. And Vola, can we invite you to help translate our questions? So question number one. In one of the preliminary practices, we are thought to generate ourselves as Buddha Shakyamuni. And then after that, after the Buddha dissolves into us. So is it appropriate for us to replace Buddha Shakyamuni to be Buddha Amitabha instead and generate ourselves as Buddha Amitabha? And... Um, after, Amitabha, after Buddha Amitabha dissolves into us, do we need to receive empowerment for doing this type of visualization? So this is the first question. Is it okay? Yeah. Yeah. 
Then the second question is, Normally, we consider our root guru as the one from whom we receive the highest yoga tantra empowerment and or prakti mosha vows. If I say that I receive these from a teacher once, but then I have never seen him again for years. So it's difficult to feel close or consider him as my root lama. In that case, would it be appropriate to consider someone like His Holiness Dalai Lama as my root teacher, although technically I didn't receive the highest yoga tantra empowerment or many teachings from him, but uh, more from faith because of who His Holiness is and the, all the online live teachings. So in this case, it would be considering the, the person based on faith as my root teacher rather than the, the teacher from whom I received the teachings. Okay, so this is, uh, there are two questions. So, uh, first of all, let's deal with the first one. So up to now, we're doing this visualization where the main figure is Buddha Shakyamuni and the, Buddha, the main figure in the merit field is Buddha Shakyamuni. The guru becomes Guru Shakyamuni. We transform into Guru Shakyamuni. We bless all sentient beings to become Guru Shakyamunis. Okay, so can we change this so that they become um, Amitabha? And do I need an empowerment to do that? Okay, so if we follow the presentation of the Lam Rim, you can see that it is very clear. The visualization is very clear. The main figure of the merit field is um, Buddha Shakyamuni. And Buddha Shakyamuni um, is surrounded by the five groups of the gurus. And then in below him, we have the deities of the four classes of Tantra, for, followed by the Sutra Buddhas, followed by Bodhisattvas, um, and then we have the hearers, solitary realizers, the heroes, the Dakinis, and then the various protectors. And when we come into the process of consolidating all these uh, um, secondary retinue figures, they come and dissolve into the main figure, which is Buddha Shakyamuni. And then Buddha Shakyamuni comes and dissolves in the guru that we have at the crown of our head. Therefore, the guru at the crown of our head becomes Guru Shakyamuni. And when he dissolves into us, we become enlightened as Buddha Shakyamuni. And then we send out rays of light and we enlightened every other sentient being in the aspect of Buddha Shakyamuni. So from beginning to end, Maybe you have counted how many times I have said Buddha Shakyamuni. So the Lamrim is very clear on that. The visualization is with Buddha Shakyamuni. So why would you want to change the visualization to Amitabha? Okay. Now, so that is the main point. Do not change the visualization. However, let's see at a different scenario. Let's say that you do want to make some prayers to Buddha Amitabha, you want to recite the name mantra, the mantra of Buddha Amitabha, you want to visualize the, the pure land of Buddha Amitabha. You have an opportunity to do that. So when um, the whole merit field consolidates into uh, Buddha Shakyamuni, Buddha Shakyamuni comes into the crown of your head and your guru becomes Buddha Shakyamuni. Okay. Then if you want to do special prayers to Buddha Amitabha, you can change the aspect of Guru Shakyamuni into Guru Amitabha at the crown of your head. And there you can do the prayers to Amitabha, prayers for the pure land of Amitabha and so forth. Okay. So Gisha is saying to have Amitabha at the crown of your head, you don't need an initiation. But to transform yourself, generate yourself as Amitabha, then you need an initiation. Okay? All right. So that was question number one. All right. So we have the second question about the root guru. Like I have received um, Haas Yoga Tantra initiation and Pratimoksha vows from this guru many years ago. But since I have not met this guru again, and therefore we don't have a close relationship, whilst I feel strong faith for His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. And although I have not received Haas Yoga Tantra initiation from him, I have not received Pratimoksha vows, 
nevertheless through the internet i have received many teachings and i have great faith so can i count uh, uh, his holiness as my root lama okay so the um response to this is that you don't have to have just one root lama and that if one lama occupies that position it is exclusive the position is now filled and no one else can be considered your root lama actually you can have many root lamas you can have five you can have six of them master atisha had 150 root lamas so it doesn't mean that your root lama is just one. Definitely this initial lama that you mentioned, you received highest yoga initiation and you received pratimoksha vows, by all means, you should consider this person your root lama. And as for his holiness, definitely you can consider him and taking him as your root lama. And since we mentioned here the internet, you have the opportunity with live teachings. Remember what we said about live teachings. So through live teachings, you can receive an initiation. You can receive Pratimoksha vows. You can receive commentaries. So definitely he can become your root lama in the full sense of receiving initiation and vows and commentaries from him. Remember live teachings, right? So it's no contradiction. You have one root lama, you can have many root lamas. 